I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. From a young prodigy named Wolfgang, to a melodic silent night, to the legendary setting of a little do re mi, the hills of Salzburg are alive with the sound of music. On the border of Austria and Germany is a darling little fairy tale town full of cobblestone streets, quaint little shops, and storybook town squares. It is known for its charm and its music heritage. You might never guess that this was also once the center of a major European power. Here's what I'm curious about in Salzburg, Austria. Why does Salzburg look more like Italy than Austria? What is so important about this address and this violin? Why is this giant fortress here and this giant cathedral here? And this bell palace here? What does this room have to do with wigs? Why do lederhosen have suspenders? And who was 16 going on 17 in this gazebo? So much to be curious about here in Salzburg. So let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. The name Salzburg comes from the word salt, and it was the salt mines that made this town rich. Salt may seem just a simple condiment today, but once upon a time, salt was as valuable as gold. In fact, we get the word salary from salt, as in paid in salt. So it is no surprise that in Salzburg, they call their salt white gold. Everything has to do with salt, the white gold, salt, the castle of salt, everything is named after salt. So that salt and some copper and gold is the reason this Alpine region was settled by the ancient Celts and Romans. One of those Roman streets is still here, by the way. We will stroll down it in a moment. But moving on with our Salzburg history, next we get the Germanic tribes and then the Bavarians. Is anyone else craving a giant pretzel right about now, sprinkled with Salzburg salt? Sorry, back to our timeline. Next, in the Middle Ages, Salzburg becomes part of the Holy Roman Empire. This is the big difference if you compare Salzburg with Austria, because we have been ruled for more than 1,000 years by Roman Catholic Church. So it was a church district, and we only turned Austria about 200 years before. So that makes the difference. Wherever you look here at Salzburg, it's built by Italians. And our nickname is the Northern Rome, the Rome out of Italy. Ah. So Salzburg becomes known as the Rome of the North or the German Rome, which is why Salzburg's street plan and architecture looks more Italian than Austrian. So let's visit that old town and that ancient Roman road that not only runs through the center of a UNESCO World Heritage Site, when you stroll down it, you feel like you're in a fairy tale. It doesn't get any more charming than this. A narrow little street lined by tall townhouses dating back to the 14th and 15th centuries and windows that get smaller and smaller as you go up and curious little arcaded passageways running through the ground floors that lead to more courtyards and more streets. And many of these historic homes have plaques marking the important dates and important former residents. This is Getreidegasse. It was one of the original Roman streets that ran through Salzburg. In the Middle Ages, it became a wonderful spot to buy goods and services. The only problem was not everybody knew how to read in the Middle Ages. So shop owners would put these beautiful signs above their shop telling what they did. For example, this was the locksmith. And this was the umbrella shop. And this Asclepius tells us this was the apothecary. Well, I guess the modern day sign does that too. And this little pair of trousers left out to dry? Well, those bring us to a grand Salzburg and Alpine tradition, the Lederhosen shop. 
How long has this shop been here? Uh, since 1408, it's the oldest shop in Salzburg. In the exact same spot? Always here? Always, always here. Wow. Yes. Always making um, clothing? Yes, uh, deer skin, uh, trousers, jackets, and so on. And Jan Markle still makes the same stitching patterns that have been used for centuries. The different patterns tell you which region it's from. This one is for Salzburg. You see the white stitching? Like this style is the same because ah, this is okay. a short one and this is a longer one. Excellent. So the white stitching is always Salzburg yeah. and then the green stitching is from yeah. the lake region called? Um, I'll see. Bad Ischl, <laughs> Bad Ischl. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Kaiser, our king made his holidays uh, in Bad Ischl. And there is a curious reason why this traditional costume has suspenders and not a belt. Just no belts, so we had suspenders? Yeah, I, I think <laughs> it's good because if uh, people, um, they are maybe a bit uh, thick, then, because of then all the bratwurst take, and the pretzel. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, they can take with this. Ah, okay. Uh, because uh, uh, this one is a um, little bit heavier, and if the man is a little bit, mm, you know, then uh, it goes down. If you have only the belt, if you have the suspenders, it's perfect. Next, just around the corner from the Lederhosen shop is apartment number nine, Getreidegasse, a very, very important and musical address here in Salzburg. But why? Well, here's a clue. Everywhere in Salzburg, from beautiful chocolates to bouncy dolls, it is all about a fella named Mozart, especially here in apartment number nine. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was born in this very room on January 27, 1756. He created his first composition at the age of only six or seven. He played on this actual violin around that same age, and the world has been enjoying his music ever since. Mozart is, of course, one of the greatest composers in history. From symphonies to operas to concertos, Mozart did it all and famously started very, very young. That is one of the most famous sheets of notes of the uh, uh, music history. That's the first manuet that uh, Wolfgang Amadeus composed. So he composed that in this, these apartments when he was seven years old? Yes. Amazing. Six, six or seven. In former times, it was thought he was five years old, but uh, specialists for uh, handwriting said, no, writing with a uh, feather and ink uh, is not possible for such a small child. He must have been at least correctness. seven. And there are other stories that say Mozart began playing music at the age of three, right here in this very apartment. His father, Leopold, described Mozart as, quote, the miracle which God let be born in Salzburg. Yes, Leopold saw it as his duty to share his son's God-given talent with the world and maybe profit a bit from it too. So Leopold brought the child genius and his sister all over Europe to perform for the royal courts. These letters tell their story. Things of everyday life, what, uh, where they went, uh, what uh, inn they visited, and if it was comfortable, who was ill, and so on. But also what uh, chances did they have to compose, to give concerts. And so we know that he was on a, a New Year's dinner at the court of the French king, and uh, that he was very well welcomed in London by K King George. And all that we know from, from these, these letters. letters. Yes. Fortunately, there are seven volumes of letters just like these, some more valuable than others. There are found additional letters again and again, and they are in, at Sotheby's or <laughs> for a very high a amount. Very high of, price, right? Yes. For the right price, Sometimes. you can have a letter too. <laughs> but this isn't the only Salzburg apartment filled with Mozart. There's another nearby where you can still hear his music today. We try to take the uh, precious music of Mozart of another time to get the feeling from that time in combination with our time and to be happy. 
and to give this feeling to the audience. Professor Joseph Walnig is a conductor and a professor at the Mozarteum University in Salzburg. Yes, there's an entire university dedicated to Mozart here. And this is Manuela Dumfart, an incredible opera singer, and together they have traveled the world, bringing the music of Mozart to audiences everywhere. But that's not the most curious part of this performance. Not only has Professor Walnig dedicated his life to the works of Mozart, he also happens to live in Mozart's widow's home. And I'm so grateful that my uh, family bought this house in 1872. It is 600 years old, you know. Uh, and that we are able to live here and to get the atmosphere of Constanze sitting on the place where you are sitting now. I picked, I picked the best spot. I the best. Constanza was Mozart's wife, and yes, this was her home. So today, to get to sit in her spot, in her home, for a private concert from two Mozart experts, well, that's just about the ultimate Salzburg experience. That's the wonderful thing. We cannot analyze this miracle Mozart, but we can only be glad to to feel what he gives us. Now, whether or not the neighbors appreciate all that joy blasting through the walls at all hours is something else altogether. Perhaps a better place to belt out Mozart's best is in a setting as grand as his music, Mirabel Palace. Mirabel Palace was built in 1606 for Prince Archbishop right now. As you can see, it was clearly a pleasure palace full of mythological figures and beauty. The location he chose was very interesting. It's high above the hill, overlooking the river, but more importantly, away from those busy streets where all the regular people were. Well, to be fair, another story says he built his palace away from the city because he was ill and the air was better up here. Whatever the purpose, the result is beautiful. So beautiful, in fact, that the name Mirabelle has Italian roots, meaning admirable or beautiful. So once again, Salzburg is the Rome of the North. Mirabelle Palace's look has changed over the years, but one thing that hasn't changed is a certain musical tradition held here in the Marble Hall. Mozart played here as a young as a young boy, and that's this influence, this, you can, you can, you can smell Mozart. Whether you prefer to smell or listen to your Mozart, his music is still played in the exact same spot where he performed for Salzburg royalty in the 1700s. What is it like as a musician to get to play in this palace, in this city that is so known for its rich music heritage? It's, it's great. It's an, it's an honor to, to play here in this Mozart city. And the Mozarteum Orchestra carries on the greatness of the boy genius. Mozart, there's a, such a deep feeling in his music. But on the other hand, it's, it's so like children. There, there's the children's joy. It's, it's so easy. You can hear it all the time. You, can, you can't get enough from the music. From the Mirabelle Palace Gardens, you can see another palace of sorts high upon a hill. So, from an elegant pleasure palace to a sturdy medieval fortress, Don those later hosen because it's time to do some hiking. To get there, we cross that ancient Roman road again, all the way until we hit the side of a mountain. Then it's time to go up, up, up to Salzburg's highest point. This is the Festungbahn. Built in 1892, this festive funicular carries passengers to the top of the fortress. So today, you can get there in less than a minute. Walking only takes about 20 minutes, but why walk when you can ride, right? And once at the top, we can explore the bigger history of Salzburg. And we do mean big. 
Built in 1077, Hohen Salzburg Fortress is the largest fully preserved fortress in all of Central Europe. It was originally built to protect the archbishops and the people of Salzburg. And apparently it worked because it has never been captured in its entire history. And the fortress has been watching over Salzburg ever since. The original 12th century single building fortress was much smaller than the complex you see today. Protective walls and bastions and additional wings and additional buildings created more courtyards and more passageways and eventually this entire fortress complex. Today, Hohen Salzburg Fortress is the proud symbol of Salzburg. At one point in time, the fortress was the temporary home to Salzburg's archbishops. And from up here, you can see their full-time home, and it is a much grander one. The imposing and elegant Dom Quartier. The Dom Quartier is in the center of town and is a reminder of when Salzburg was a major power within the Holy Roman Empire. That's why the complex includes not just the cathedral, but also the monastery and, of course, the archbishop's residence. But it wasn't just any archbishop who lived here. The leaders of Salzburg had the title Prince Archbishop. And as you see from the title, Prince Archbishop means secular ruler as a prince and, of course, ruler of the Roman Catholic community as a bishop, archbishop. And therefore, he was the personification of absolutism and power. And that absolute power was over not just the darling little fairy tale town of Salzburg, but the much, much bigger state of Salzburg. And the state Salzburg were far more extended than it is today. The political influence and the rule by the Prince Archbishop were from the Kimsey Lake, which is today in Bavaria, mm -hmm. down to the Slovenian borders, and even oh, small wow. areas of Upper Austria. It was really the powerful place in the heart of Europe. You can compare it only to the Vatican in Rome. And if you wanted to visit the all-powerful Prince Archbishop, you would have to make it through a series of rooms. The name of the hall is Carabinieri Hall. It's named after the Carabinieri Guard. And what happened here is that this special guard were installed here and they had to separate the visitors, like either they're going to the state rooms or maybe, quite rarely, they were allowed to enter the private household. If you made it through there, you would then go into this room, conveniently decorated with a how-to guide on the ceiling. As if you look up on the ceiling painting, you see Alexander the Great, and oh, the city yes. of Rome is kneeling in front of him to swear an oath. And this was exactly what happened in the Baroque time in Salzburg as well. As soon as you were allowed to arrive here and you saw the Prince Archbishop, you have to knee down and wait until he shows you with a very gentle gesture that you're allowed to get up on your feet again. Oh, excellent. But guests never went into this room it was reserved only for the Prince Archbishop himself for a very funny reason. Let's talk about hairstyles, because it's all, it's all about how, 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 we, how we look, all about how we look, how we look. Which room were we this in? This is the Ritterade, which is a nice name for waiting room. Sometimes they try to get rid of the wig because- Oh, in this room they would take room, their wig off? Yeah, some, oh. for, because it's a private room. Okay. And after hours of meetings, it's maybe, you know, like, it's like the tie today, you cut it right, off and right. they got rid of the wig. Now let's talk about the wigs, and, and obviously it wasn't just the Prince Archbishops, but right. everybody in this time period. Why were men, and why were they wearing wigs instead of just their own, styling their own hair? In the Baroque time, the hygienic standards were not quite nice. And the people realized if you have a short haircut, it's far easier to get the little animals out of your hair. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> That's true though, it's That's true. A Okay, now that we've debugged our wigs, we're ready for church. And to get there, we go through the many, many connecting rooms and passageways from the residence to the cathedral. And we are greeted by two saints. Why two? Here we have the two patron saints of Salzburg. On this side is St. Virgil, who is holding a model of the church because he oversaw the building of the first Salzburg dome. On this side, we have St. Rupert, who you will always see holding a barrel of salt because of course it was the salt that gave Salzburg its wealth. This brings us to the history of Salzburg Cathedral. Over the centuries, the church suffered several fires and was rebuilt each time. When it was rebuilt in the 1600s, the design was one of the very first Baroque churches north of the Alps, designed by an Italian architect. There's that Italian connection again. He never built such a huge 
cathedral before, so he developed a few new ideas. One idea quite new are the balconies, which makes the acoustic okay. as well quite unique. And acoustics are important since 900 worshippers can be seated here. Speaking of sound, wouldn't you know it, there is another Salzburg music connection here. Two, actually. Both Mozart and Joseph Moore, who wrote Silent Night, were baptized here. You might even say that the cathedral is alive with the sound of music. Oh wait, isn't it the hills that are alive with the sound of music? Yep, for our last bit of Curious Salzburg, we go back up those hills where a singing family made their town famous in the 20th century. The Sound of Music isn't just a hit Broadway musical and one of the most popular musical films of all time. In fact, it actually brought worldwide attention to Salzburg's history, architecture, and natural beauty. My favorite things, climb every mountain, and Edelweiss. The Sound of Music is perhaps the most precious legacy of Salzburg. In fact, so many fans from around the world kept visiting Salzburg just to see the Sound of Music sites that this tour evolved out of it. On it, you'll learn the real story of Maria and the Von Trapps and what was a little movie magic, especially that escaping over the Alps on foot part. The real story is that Captain Von Trapp was smart enough. He left before uh, they closed the border. And they took their rucksack, went on a train, leaving from Salzburg next to the house to Italy and from there they moved to the U.S. And that's one of the funniest um, uh, differences between the real story and the movie is if you look at a map, well, no, they're not gonna cross the mountains wearing their dress and go to Switzerland. They just hopped on a train and went to Italy. It's a whole yeah. lot closer. Yeah. It's a whole lot closer. And you know, if they would have walked over this mountain shown by the Fox movie, they would walk straight to Hitler's eagle's nest. But it looked prettier to film on top of a mountain. That's why yeah. they did it, so they did it. Well, creative storytelling aside, today you can see some of the real Salzburg locations for some of the most famous scenes in the film. And this, of course, is the famous gazebo that was the setting for 16 going on 17 and also something good. Uh, but no, I am not going to sing those for you. <laughs> and this is the Leopold Scron Palace, the fictional Von Trapp family home. And this is the church where Maria and Captain Von Trapp got married in the lovely little town of Monsey. And this is the bridge where Maria and the children skipped across, wearing those play clothes made out of curtains. By the way, the bridge is named the Mozart Bridge. Well, of course it is. And finally, do you recognize this scene? The beautiful Mirabel Palace is a UNESCO World Heritage Site right here in the heart of Salzburg. And of course, the adjoining Mirabel Gardens were famously used in the sound of music when Maria and the Von Trapp children sang, Do, Re, Mi which will bring us back to Do, 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 and back to that beautiful Mirabel Palace where the young Mozart performed. The Sound of Music, Mozart, and a Prince Archbishop's Italian Palace. All in one place, that's Salzburg. So from Salt to St. Rupert to the state of Salzburg, that was once so powerful that its leaders needed a palace complex this big, which has special rooms for wigs and bugs, and a soaring cathedral that is more Italian than Austrian, as are Salzburg squares and streets, including an important ancient Roman street, where a child was born with a musical gift from God. That is still played centuries later in another apartment just a few steps away, which is near a centuries-old shop that supports Salzburg's sturdy mountain men <laughs> in a town that is kept safe by a sturdy fortress on a mountaintop that is surrounded by even more hills that, yes, are alive with the sound of music. Salzburg has so much to be curious about. Thank you for joining us on our educational journey, and hopefully now you're even more curious about the who, what, where, why, when, and how of beautiful Salzburg. As they say here in Salzburg, Gute Reise!